marketing triumphs again. Another bloody battle. Customers won over. Employees excited. Marketers tired. Hey, welcome to the Unified CXM Experience. And as always, I'm your host, Grad Khan, CXO, Chief Experience Officer at Sprinkler. And I want to talk today about books. Yeah. Um, we are uh, in the midst of our How to Write a Marketing Plan series. And I have been getting a number of questions from people around how do I get you know good content or ideas or how do I sort of stimulate my thinking as I think about being an innovative marketer. Uh, so I'm going to sort of jump into that. I am going to mention an article uh, that you should probably read. Uh, I don't do this very often, but I read an article today in Ad Age, and it's absolutely fantastic. It's called Metaverse Marketing, Everything Brands Need to Know About Virtual Worlds, uh, from NFTs to virtual clothing to Zuckerberg's meta. And it's by uh, Asa Hyken, A-S-A, Hyken, H-I-K-E-N. Uh, it was published uh, Jan 24, which is today, uh, 2022. And it's an, an excellent article on the whole growing um, trend with NFTs. Talks about what Gary Vaynerchuk's doing. Uh, talks about what different brands are doing with NFTs. Some upsides, some downsides. Uh, very, very, very big downside for McDonald's with an NFT they did for their McRib. Uh, and uh, there, I would say that as you read the article... Uh, you should make sure you also click on the links to other linked articles like top marketers that are doing uh, work in the metaverse. It's actually a fantastic article in terms of content, um, some of the downsides, etc. cetera. And um, I would uh, say that we're all going to need to spend time here because uh, the general philosophy, and this is clearly what Sprinkler has done brilliantly, is you want to put your brand where your customers are. And as customers migrated from traditional channels to modern channels, uh, Sprinkler allowed marketers and organizations to connect with their customers. And that migration continues in the virtual world as the metaverse gets built out. It's really early. It's really early, but it doesn't hurt to get in there now. And as a marketer, you always need to be a scientist. And scientists like to experiment early with the latest technology. So take a look at that article uh, read that, enjoy that. And it goes into a general theme I have about marketers and reading. I did once a long time ago, not how long ago, but when in my, when my second Microsoft job, when I was onboarding as a CMO for Microsoft US, I was uh, talking to everyone on the team. And I was talking to one of the team members, great person, uh, super smart. And uh, she was doing a bunch of interesting things in sort of the media field. And I made a recommendation of a couple of books that I thought would be fun for her to read. And she sort of looked at me with kind of look on her face. And she said, when would I have time to read uh, like books? And I was like, well, why isn't like, you mean, what do you mean time? And she's like, I'm super busy during the day. And I'm like, well, I wasn't thinking you'd read it like on the job. I was thinking you'd read it like at night or on the weekends. And again, she sort of looked at me like weirdly like, what? She's like, I don't do, like, I don't do marketing stuff outside the office. I kind of had a little bit of a tingle on this one. Kind of like, really? What's going on here? And I said, well, what do you do? And she's like, well, I'm really into music and I'm really, I think I've got all these other things I'm interested in and I don't, I'm not interested in marketing enough to read about it. All right. And I said, well, why would you do something for a living that you're so uninterested in that you don't actually want to read about it or study or get better. It just seems weird to me. And um, ultimately, she actually ended up leaving and going into the music business and moving to L.A. where there's sort of the music capital and has been doing great and has been having a, a really super time. And so and I, and I love that because she's now doing for a living what she was doing sort of as a hobby and following uh, passion. And I think that's a very, very important thing to do. And if you think about most professions, like lawyers go to legal conferences and they're always reading about cases. Um, the doctors go to uh, continuing medical CME courses to make sure that they're keeping their skills up and they're, they're reading journals and stuff on the weekends. Uh, my brother is an organic chemist. Uh, he, you know, has organic chemistry journals that he reads and he's always staying up to date on the latest scientific stuff. And I can't imagine Morgan ever saying, read about organic chemistry on the weekend. 
Well, I wouldn't want to do that. I <laughs> just like you would never say that, <laughs> right? Like the Morgan's passion is this field and biotech, and and so he does it as a job and has been very successful at it, uh, and also continues to educate himself on it because you know the field keeps evolving. And if one field's evolving, it's been evolving a lot over the last 150 years, but holy schmoly, is <laughs> marketing is going crazy right now. And if you have any hope of trying to stay up to speed, you've got to study it like you're a lawyer, a doctor, a scientist, or whatever. Pick your profession. Uh, and almost every profession out there you know, upgrades their skills and talents on a going basis. But for some reason, a lot of marketers don't. So um, read, read, read. And so I have something that I put on my blog. And by saying I put it on my blog, I mean Randy published it for me. Thank you, Randy. Randy still there? I'm still here. Thanks, Randy. Oh, he's still there. Well, I'm thanks here. for doing that. You did a nice yeah. job on this one. Sure. Um, anyway, so so Randy popped it up there. And I don't actually don't really talk about my blog, I think, at all, right, Randy? Have I ever mentioned my blog on this? Been a long know. time if you've mentioned it. Maybe really early in the Maybe. series. Okay, so I have been writing a blog for you know, 15 or, or so years now, I guess. Quite a long time. It's called Copernican Shift. And it's based on this idea that um, uh, Copernican Shift is one where you change the center of the universe in order to gain true insight into what's going on. So, for example, it may seem like the... Um, uh, universe turns around your product, but in fact, the universe really revolves around your customer. And when you get that picture and understand how your product fits into their overall universe, you have a much greater chance of being successful with your customer. So, and it's obviously based on the Copernican insight that the earth moves around the sun, the sun doesn't move around the earth. And so uh, I've been running Copernican shift for a long time and there's a ton of stuff on there. It's all in WordPress, which has been great. And I have a reading list on there that we've, we published it originally maybe a year or two ago and got a lot of great reaction to it. It's been read a lot. Uh, people are always asking me for books that they should read as a new marketer. I just flip them a link to this particular post uh, and we just updated it with a few new books. So what I thought I'd do is uh, just you know, go, go to the homepage, copernicanshift.com and you can uh, see it there. Uh, you can also do a search on this reading list will make you a better marketer and that should pop it up as well. And on the list are some, some classics that you would have heard me talk about already, like Scientific Advertising and My Life in Advertising by Claude Hopkins. Probably doesn't really need an introduction if you're a avid listener of the Unified CXM experience, but Claude Hopkins wrote the first book on advertising. And you know it was about how advertising is a scientific discipline and can be used to sell products in a very measured way, which is essentially the world we live in today. Uh, I would say it's an interesting artifact in a couple of ways. One is that at the time when they were doing a lot of print, they were able to uh, measure the reaction that people had to their ads by measuring uh, people's mail-ins, coupon redemptions, and sort of other reaction mechanisms they built into those print ads. When TV came out in the 1960s and sort of the, the creative revolution led by Bill Bernbach and, and many others, uh, Mary Wells, et cetera, um, the measurability really disappeared. We could measure audience size, but we couldn't measure reaction, impact. And so I think for a whole generation or maybe even a couple of generations of marketers, accountability became very soft and marketers got used to that softness. And I think in some ways the profession gathered a bit of a negative reputation for being all about, you know, soft stuff and brand building, but not really generating sales. Uh, in the sort of modern marketing generation that started around 2006 or so when Marketo launched, uh, you could argue Eloqua launched in 2003, that might've been the dawn of it. Uh, we've now moved into a more measured, potentially overly measured, but more measured marketing era. And it's very similar today to the world that Claude Hopkins lived in. So what's fascinating when you read this book is that you, you are reading a book from 1929, roughly say 1930. Uh, so a book that's um, you know nearly a hundred years old. Uh, there are some vernacular issues. So there are some like just words and examples that he uses that make it a little difficult to understand. Uh, if you 
aren't familiar with them, you might have to look a few things up. But just push past that because the, the base of what he's talking about and the, the insights that he has are, are, are key and they will help you today just because selling is selling. People buy stuff uh, the same way no matter which generation it's in. Stuff changes a little bit, but uh, not, not that much. Another good example actually of a sort of vernacular change or context change that can be quite challenging is there's another book on my list, which is um, by Ross Reeves, and it's called Reality and Advertising. And in that book, he talks about the greatest ad campaign of all time, which was the Pepsodent uh, No More Pink Toothbrush campaign. Now, that campaign has been a bit lost in the sands of time. People don't, I think, talk about that as one of the greatest campaigns ever. But that campaign did single-handedly uh, create the daily toothbrushing habit we have now uh, and revolutionized uh, tooth care and dental care and, you know, I would say our health in general. So a very, very, very important campaign. Um, but he keeps talking about it like you would know what he's talking about because, you know, he wrote the book in the 1960s. And, um, and the very first time I read the book, I was like, what's with the pink toothbrush? I don't, I don't understand that. What does he mean? No more pink toothbrush. I don't understand like why the toothbrush would be pink. And and in fact, it's not that the toothbrush is pink; it's that the bristles of the toothbrush were pink. So then you're like, um, all right. So why are the bristles of a toothbrush pink? Okay. So um, what used to happen is people brush their teeth so infrequently with like tooth powder that their gums would bleed because their mouths were rotting. I know. I hope you're not listening to this over dinner. Sorry, mom. <laughs> and so when you pull your toothbrush out of your mouth, you know, the blood mixed with, you know, water and stuff like that would, you know, make the bristles of your toothbrush pink. Uh, and Pepsi didn't came out with a campaign, which is brush your teeth every day. Now, of course, we're now two to three times a day after every meal. But at the time, once a day, it was a pretty big leap. And uh, and they had, it was a paste, toothpaste. And then, you know, they kind of, like I said, changed the history of oral care uh, in the country. Um, so that's, again, another thing of context. Now, the point that he's making is he talks, in Ross Reeves' book, uh, he talks about the um, universal selling proposition, or USP, uh, or actually, excuse me, the unique selling proposition, not universal. Well, that'd be kind of cool too. But the unique selling proposition or USP and always have a USP. Um, and I think we've gotten better at that generally. Um, but at the time, again, a lot of people just said, get my name out there. Uh, and he's like, don't get your name out there. You got to get your name out there with a promise, a promise that means something like no more pink toothbrush. So, uh, so those are kind of, kind of the t examples of the types of books that are, that are on the original lead read list with some, you know, some continuing to kind of move through the decades. And I, I am a big believer in reading the historical stuff as well as the most modern stuff. Uh, and, um, probably the most contemporary book on there uh, is one called the idea writers by, uh, Teresa Ayaza. Uh, and it's probably one of the most brilliant books that it, it talks about the evolution from one-way messaging to conversation. So the thing that we talk about all the time on this show is the move from broadcast to conversation. And the idea writers, uh, Teresa talks about this as well and does it in a brilliant way. It connects to past history uh, and is potentially the best book I've ever read on advertising. I'm actually, I cried when I read it, partly because it was so brilliant. I mean, I literally cried. I was on a potentially a little tired at the time. So <laughs> there may have been some exhaustion in there as well. I was on a flight to... I think I was going to fly to Singapore. I had a, a flight to Singapore where I I flew from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I spoke at a conference there uh, with John Chambers. Got on a plane, flew from there to JFK. Flew from JFK to uh, I think it was uh, I think it was Netherlands, and then flew from there to Singapore. And then uh, did a speech in Singapore and 10 hours later, got back on an airplane, flew to Dubai and then flew to Toronto. So I was a 23 hour flight 
to Singapore and a 21 hour flight back from Singapore with a 10 hour layover. That was my, so maybe the crying was for other reasons as well, but to give the book some credit, the other reason I think I cried is I wish I'd written it. It's just, it was like, it's like the book I wish I'd written. It's just so good. Uh, so if you really want to start at the most contemporary end of the scale, like that's, that's kind of near the end. And one of the, the last books written or the most recent books written is one called Mad Women by Jane Moss. And Jane Moss is like uh, one of my heroes. Uh, I'm deeply regretful that I did not reach out to her earlier in my life. I don't know why. I mean, I literally started an ad agency because of one of the books that she wrote. Uh, and, um, and she died, you know, recently. And so I, I'll never get a chance to meet her, but, uh, uh, but she wrote a book called Mad Women, which is a modern book, um, but it was a reflection on what it was like to really work in an ad agency in the 1960s. And she um, sort of takes down some of the stereotypes from the show Mad, Mad Men. Um, anyway, so we've done some updates, though. So those, so, you know, kind of take a look at the original list. But the updates um, are not just strictly advertising books. And I'll start with the last one on the list because um, – it's got nothing to do with that advertising or business. It's a book called The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. If you're a science fiction fan, you've, I'm sure, heard of this book. Uh, Jules Verne wrote this, um, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, and I've always thought this is a great book to have if I got lost on a desert island. Because he does a great job of talking about what plants to eat, which plants not to eat, you know, how to build a hut, you know, how to, you know, make a telephone out of bamboo, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, all Gilgan's Island stuff. And, uh, it's just, it's a wonderful book in terms of, you know, competing against the elements. And I, one of the, the things that we, we've talked about a little bit, maybe about a year ago, and we'll, we'll talk about it again, probably as we get into the summer, but there's this concept of grit in both business and in life. And that they find is that people who have got grit and are gritty uh, tend to succeed because they they stay in the fight. A Mysterious Island is a book all about grit, uh, and it's a wonderful way of thinking about your day. And as bad as your day may be, you're not on the Mysterious Island. <laughs> Plus, it's a, a nice revisit of Captain Nemo and a whole bunch of other things. Won't give it all away, but it's uh, it's great. It also was made into a movie in the 1960s, uh, and is one of the first movies I ever saw as a kid. So it's uh, it sort of has a lot of nostalgia for me as well. Um, the other books on there that I've added, I added the first 90 days. Uh, if you're changing jobs and kind of who isn't these days, uh, it's a great book to understand how to onboard in a new job. I don't, don't switch jobs often, but when I have, I, I always reread this book. And what's so weird is it's like a new book every time because I've tended to switch industries and I've tended to switch sizes of companies and stuff. So I'm in a radically different situation than I was before. And so the book feels new because they're talking to me in a different way. Um, it's one of the insights that they had when they wrote this book was they were looking at the management research that existed at the time. And what they found was that, um, all the management research was based on how professors were being hired by businesses to consult on problems the businesses had. But one of the most common manager uh, experiences is job change, sometimes within the same company, but job change. But because managers were in the midst of a job change, they didn't have the money or resources to buy the time of a consultant. So it's this entire uh, branch of management science that was essentially missing uh, because professors weren't being paid to consult during that period of time. And so they wrote this fantastic book, which is, I think, sort of close the door on anyone else going after it because it's just so perfect and it's a great way to onboard. And I'll actually tell a new team, this is what I'm using to onboard. Uh, here's where I am in the process and the, all the things that I'm doing and how they relate to that. And if you want to know exactly what the next 90 days are going to look like, go read this book and you'll know what I'll be doing. It's actually very relaxing for people because they're like, oh, he's walking through a process. He knows what he's doing. Uh, maybe he's not paying attention to this thing over here, but that's because he's focused on this other thing. And he told me that's what he's doing and he's going to get to this next week. So um, a great way to onboard. Another one is a very, very new book. In fact, I think it was released this week, if I'm not mistaken, uh, called Amp It Up by Frank Slootman. Um, maybe just available in Dead Tree versions and last week in the Kindle version. Uh, and it's all his Bible for leading 
hyper growth companies, how to raise expectations, increase urgency and elevate intensity. Uh, Frank Slootman is, you know, famously the CEO of Snowflake and before that ServiceNow and before that uh, Data, Data Dynamics, I think, uh, and uh, has sort of had three massive hits going in there as an operator and making a company accelerate its momentum. So uh, a great book from somebody who uh, knows what he's doing and uh, definitely worth reading. He's been actually all over my LinkedIn. So I um, someone did an interview with him and asked him, why are you writing this all down? Why are you doing so many interviews? And he said, I feel an obligation to share uh, what I've learned with others as a way of giving back, which is pretty cool. Um, another book, which is, again, not really a business book, but maybe is one, is called Team of Rivals. Uh, this book's been out for quite a while. It's, the Paul, the, it's about the political genius of Abraham Lincoln. It's by Doris Kearns Goodwin, who is a national treasure, let's just put it that way. And, uh, and what she does in this book, she talks about how Lincoln brought his political rivals onto his, um, into this, his White House. So they sat... Um, in the White House, um, around his um, what would be what would be called Randy? This is where my Canadian's showing through. Uh, what would be the um, staff function in the White House when they sit around the table? What would that be called? Like his cabinet. 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 Thank yeah. you. Exactly. His cabinet. You nailed that one. Um, I knew that. I was just testing you. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't know that. Uh, so yeah. So his cabinet was composed of uh, political rivals. And by bringing them in, he was able to form a coalition and get different kinds of ideas. Um, people weren't just, you know, telling him what he needed, to, what he wanted to hear. Uh, often they're telling him what he needed to hear. And you could argue that, to a large measure, it's very likely this country is a country today uh, because of that type of structure. It's a good lesson for how we think about what we build as our uh, teams when we're building a marketing team. Uh, I'm I'm a fan of having people on my team who will push back and who will say that's stupid and yell at me and uh, I think it I think it works because uh, it helps you get better, think better, and and be surrounded by people who are doing things the way that they think they should be done, not the way you think they should be done. And that's really important to make sure you're surrounded by independent thinkers. So, great book, probably one of the best history books ever written. So definitely worth reading. And the last one is a, a classic that um, has kind of fallen off the favorites list, but never gets tired, which is How to Win Friends and Influence People uh, by Dale Carnegie. Uh, it is a, a really important book, I think, to read uh, because what he talks about is that you can't truly uh, engage with someone unless your mindset is correct and I don't think he uses the words mindset, but unless you're thinking about them the correct way. For example, um, if I want someone to, um, if I want to be friends with somebody, and but I think they're an idiot, but I think they could help me, it's unlikely I'm going to make that successful. I have to get my head wrapped around the fact that this is a unique, special individual who's really amazing, who I should know, and then I'll be able to f to follow it. And it's an, the earliest book, or one of the earliest books, on this concept of how mindset drives outcomes. If you think something negative is going to happen, it's likely to happen because the more you say, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work, the more likely your subconscious mind will say, oh, okay, and help it not work. So the power of suggestion, the power of mindset is what these books are all about. Um, you can't read enough of those. So read Dale Carnegie, if you get a chance. So that's kind of a quick review of the uh, the book list, and we'll keep adding to it. I probably should have added something to it last year, but you know, got distracted with uh, these podcasts, I guess. And um, and I have found that these these reading list suggestions have been well received, and people like to have them. And uh, if you've got suggestions, uh, and if you, you know, want to add, add something, uh, you know, drop us a line. Uh, just DM me on Twitter. I'm Grad Con, and say, hey, this is a really great book that every marketer should read and we'll pop it on the list and we'll credit you. So that's it for today for the Unified CXM Experience. I'm Grad Khan, CXO, Chief Experience Officer at Sprinkler, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.